So now we have the second lecture of Sofkam Saifadini about uh, on, his, on the algebraic structure on the group of area preserving on memory physics. So, so when you report on yesterday, all we need to remember from yesterday is that uh, there were these magical numbers, which are called magical invariants, which are called C sub B, these were spectral invariants, as they're called. They're produced using Thor homology. And then they lead to a solution of uh, a solution of the class as a group of area preserving homomorphisms, yes, to not a complete. So for the rest of my lectures, uh, the goal is just to work our way towards the construction of these invariants. Uh, so uh, today uh, we are going to see their construction in the context of uh, Morse law, and then we'll see the construction again in the context of law. Okay. So now my first slide was, uh, my first part was uh, on slides. I had a lot of stuff to say, much introduction. Sorry if I went fast. Uh, to slow down, I'll go I'll right on the board, but now the disadvantage is that we'll have to live with my hand. It's not exactly the best. Okay, so uh, let me start by recalling, many of you might have seen this, but I just want to recall very quickly or, uh, 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 the definition of more homology, and then we'll see the spectral invariance in this model. And once we move to floor homology, you'll see that floor homology is, in a, in a formal way, very, very similar to the classical Morse homology. Okay, so we start with a manifold M. I assume it's closed. And then uh, I let, I'll take G to be a Riemannian metric on it. Now I'll take F to be a function on M, and we say it's Morse, so F is Morse, meaning that all critical, so crit F, the set of critical points of F, uh, critical points of F, sorry, of F are all non degenerate So meaning if you look at the Hessian at each of the critical points, it's an invertible. Now, here is the definition of the Morse chain complex. So there is going to be a homology. First, there is a chain complex. And I give you the definition of the generators of the chain complex. So you'll see the differential in a second. So the notation is, uh, I'll use today is C sub M. So it's going to be an index K, which I'll introduce in a second. Plus the Morse complex of F is just this. The Z2 vector space, so the span over Z2 of the critical function. Okay, now there's an index as well, which we don't need too much, but uh, good to know that it's there. And the index of a more critical point that uh, you might already know, index of X. It's just uh, the dimension of the descending submanifold. Right, so you could locally near X, you could write F equals, uh, I'm saying index equals K, right? That's the definition of it. So near X, F can be written as uh, in this form, in local coordinates. Uh, and the K you see here is there. So uh, what's important is then you're taking, uh, so we're, I'm taking this finite dimensional vector space over Z2, which is generated by the critical point. So finally, many points. Because F is non degenerate. We'll just find the main component. Now, here's the interesting part of the story. There is a differential we can define on this complex, the Morse differential. This is where the story starts to get more interesting. So, how is this defined? So, first, let's see. It's a map, I know it's denoted by D or a partial. It goes from the chain complex. 
for uh, actually the chain complex is going to depend on F and the Riemannian metric G. So G doesn't enter the definition of the, the vector space, but it will enter the definition of the difference. So CMK, it goes from CMK of F G to CM. K minus one of F B, so lower than X by one. And here is how it's defined. It's a linear map, so I just have to tell you where each generator goes. So you take a vertical point X and you send it to the following sum. Now tell you what the sum is, the various terms in a sum are things like that. So you count certain objects, which I'll say in a second, but let me introduce the notation first. You count certain objects from the negative gradient trajectory that go from X to Y. You take sum over Y such that index of Y equals K minus one. So Y is the over all critical points of one index one lower than that. Uh, obviously it has to be of the, this one. So it has to be some number times Y of this form. Uh, I'll tell you now, let's see what the number, the, this definition of this count. Is. So it's a Z2 count. And you count certain things and you record, you put zero if it's even and you put one. So what is this M hat of XY? So first let's see M of XY. This is the space of gradient, negative gradient trajectories from X to Y. So it's the set of maps U from the real line into M that satisfy the following property. So firstly, they go at negative infinity, they're at X. So they start at X, and uh, they arrive at y at positive, and they satisfy the negative gradient trajectory system. So u dot equals minus gradient of that. Right. And, and this is where the Riemannian metric enters because to define the gradient of f, you need the Riemannian. Right. So this gradient of f is the definition of that. Uh, it, once you put it in the first component of Riemannian metric, it gives you the f. Back. Wait, so, I mean, the, you should, if you want to see a picture, I mean, you should really keep this picture in mind. People draw all the time. So it's the set of, you're counting the set of objects that looks like this. This is U, this is X, and X, uh, U goes from uh, X to Y. <clears throat> you're looking at this. Now, uh, Here's a fact that's not uh, too hard to prove. Maybe I'll, well, I could push it up. So I'll write it here and push it up. So fact, M of X, Y, so the space of gradient trajectories from X to Y is a manifold of dimension index of X minus index of X, which is in this case, one. But in general, if, if X and Y differ by index more than one, you still have the same point. Okay. Now, in this context, it's not very hard to see because this it could be, uh, th this M of XY can be identified with the intersection of the descending submanifold of X and ascending submanifold of Y, which is exactly that. Uh, so we, which is under generic conditions on G, it's a, it's a smooth manifold of this dimension. So this fact that should be, sorry, for generic J, for generic choice of G. Now, note that uh, there is an R action of R on M on the moduli space. So we call M the moduli space of gradient trajectories from X to Y. Well, because if there's a U in here, uh, then you could send, then you could translate you by any fixed number, and that's also. In. So I mod out by this action, and I define m hat to be the space of unparametrized gradient trajectories from x to y. This is a zero-dimensional manifold because M was a one-dimensional. 
And uh, there's a compactness theorem that's <coughs> another fact is that M hat is fine. Oh, so the space of such trajectories is compact. I'm not explaining, I mean, I'm not explaining a lot of why this is true. I'm just stating. It. Okay, so this means that D is well defined. Any questions about the definition of the differential? Yes. But the index difference is two there. Right. So if you take the north, that, that's actually a great example to look at because if you look at the north south on the sphere, so then, uh, so example. This uh, the height function on the round sphere. Then index here is index two. This is index zero. So cm two is equal to z two. Cm one is zero. There's nothing, and cm sub zero is also z two. So then the differential is zero because the differential lowers index by one. So it goes from here to zero, and then there's nothing to go. So so d equals zero, and well, I haven't defined more homology, but then you see that more homology is Z2. Okay, now uh, the definition of more homology. So it turns out that D squared is zero. Meaning if you look at CMK, I'm dropping F and G from the notation. Uh, so CMK plus one, D lowers it, the index sends it to CMK. And then you look at D again, lowers index to CMK minus one. Uh, I'm saying this composition is, okay, so it goes, so it gives you zero, which means that kernel of DK includes, contains image of kernel of D into, well, maybe I should call this dk plus one and this dk. Kernel of dk contains image of dk plus one. Okay, so then you could define the Morse homology uh, of the pair fg to be kernel. I'll put this on the top of this. So we define. More homology of the pair FG to be the kernel of the auto image. Okay, so it's a vector space over C. Let me quickly explain. So, so I mean, this definition uh, obviously makes sense once I know D squared is zero. Let me quickly explain why D squared is zero. So, here is why. D squared is zero. Let's look at what D squared actually counts. So if I apply D squared to a point X, then it counts. Okay, so it's a count. It's going to be again a count of certain objects times points Y. For now, Y index of Y equals index X minus two. And what do we count for objects that look like this? So you start at X, you apply the differential, you arrive at some point, you, you, you know, you have a you follow a gradient trajectory, you go to a point of index one lower, let's call it Z, and then you apply Z again, apply D again, and now you arrive at Y. You, you, you count objects that look like this. These are called like broken. So what should go here is broken. <laughs> Morse trajectories, which trajectories from X to Y. But we need to show there's an even number of such trajectories. And once we show it's even, then since we're counting mod two, then we'll get some. And why is this, uh, why is there an even count? Well, 
Now let's look at the moduli space of honest gradient trajectory. So there's a set of honest gradient trajectories from X to Y. So curves that look like this. Now I said there was this fact that I put here. There is the fact, the dimension of the, the, the fact says the dimension of the moduli. So the dimension of the space of trajectories from X to Y is given by index of X minus index of Y. Now, so that tells you that the space of curves that go from X to Y is two dimensional, but we always mod out by the R translation. So we get a one dimensional manifold. And so you have a one dimensional manifold that looks like this. And it turns out that it accumulates, these curves accumulate at broken objects like this one. Okay, so. Space of unparametrized gradient trajectories from X to Y is a one dimensional manifold. And admits a compactification. This compact. If you add compactification by adding broken trajectory, compactification with boundary of this compactification equal broken trajectories. So this is this is another important fact that I'm just important facts that I'm just stating without giving you a clue. So meaning that. The space, these broken trajectories appear as boundaries of a one-dimensional moduli space. So there's gonna be a one-dimensional one family of such curves. Eventually they kind of break at another point and they give you another broken trajectory from X to from Z prime and then down to Z. Okay, so they come in pairs. And that's why these are So that's uh, that, that's kind of what goes into the the space uh, the the this fact here. I'm not explaining why that's happening, but it. I mean, if that were to happen, then the the, the theorem that proves this shows that there is uh, there is a gluing theorem that tells you near broken trajectory you have a one dimensional family, but you could only smooth in one direction, but not in two directions. So that that goes into the proof. Yeah. So there's quite a bit of. Right, let's call uh, the, the, the gluing theorem says that you could find some, you take a broken trajectory nearby you can find these smooth out trajectories and it tells you exactly how many directions can you find these trajectories up in how many different directions you could find them it turns out to be just one so if you had your situation and you were going around then it would turn out that this is actually not a broken trajectory you'd be on the sphere Oh, perhaps that could happen as well. Yeah, right, 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 right. The prime could be Z, but then the broken trajectory is yeah, yeah. Then, then you have in two different directions could work. What was this? Admits a compactification. Sorry, I oh, I wrote compactification. Uh, okay, admits a compactification. Right, Z prime could be the same as Z, but uh, you, you can't smooth out the same broken trajectory in two different directions. Right. Okay, so that's why D squared is zero. And that's why this, this homology makes sense. So a priori, it depends on the choice of F and the choice of G. But then there is another theorem that says it doesn't depend on anything. So another theorem says, so theorem, the Morse homology of the pair FG is actually equal to the singular homology of the manifold F. So this is singular homology or Durant homology. Okay. So in the end, you recover nothing but the usual homology of the manifold. So it might look like a lot of work for nothing, but actually, it's helpful. So for example, one thing that you could deduce from this is that the number of critical points for the Morse function is bounded from below by the rank of the homology of the manifold. The topology forces a certain number of critical points. 
This is a famous Morrison quote. Okay. So that, that was my review of morsemology. If there are no questions about that, then I'll uh, uh, then I'll say what's spectral in there. Are there any questions? So what what one needs to keep in mind here is, is that we have a complex uh, generated by critical points. Uh, there is a differential on this complex, this boundary map D, which just counts gradient trajectories between points, uh, between different points. Uh, and, and then this gives you a homology, and the homology is single. That's all. That's what we need to retain for that. Maybe I'll write on this. Now, spectral invariance. And these are also known under the name of Lucernic Schneerelman invariants. Uh, I guess they were the first people to introduce them. Uh, so, here is what they'll do fix T and R. Fix the number T and R. And now look at this subcomplex. So I define CMT of F. I should put the Riemannian metric G as well to be the span over Z2 of critical points of F, which have which are tight below T. Never remember if I want less than equal to or less than okay. So I just look at uh, all points which uh, which I see up to high speed. So it's the same complex as before, but I don't go all the way into it. Now note differential actually preserves this subcomplex. So the statement here is that. If you take a critical point uh, at level less than T, then you apply the differential, what you see is also at level less than T. And the reason for that is that you're looking at the, the picture, you're counting negative gradient trajectory. So height is lower, F decreases along the gradient trajectory. So meaning if I go from here, then I land in some spaces, uh, in some CMT that's too small. Okay, so that, that that's a key point here. That so we have this what we call this you have a filtration on the on the complex. We provide it as the union of uh, uh, various complexes CMT for T in ranging in R, and each CMT is actually a subcomplex in its own. The differential restricts to a well-defined term. Okay, and so and as before, D squared is zero. But then I can define. Uh, what people call filtered Morse homology. So homology at height T, as before. Okay, so this is, just to spell it out, is the kernel of D from TMT to TMT modded out by its image. Okay, so for each value of t, then I get a new vector space. It's got an index two. So for each value of t, I get a new homology that now actually does depend on the choice of that. It turns out, so this 
So another fact is this HMT of FG depends on F, but not on G. But not the remodeling. So now we get an invariant of the function. So now this, this doesn't depend on just the manifold, it depends on actual function. How do you think about the function? Which makes perfect, uh, well, well, actually, uh, uh, perhaps I should have said this first. Here's another fact. It's not hard to see this. Actually, the homology, this H, what, what I call HM superscript T of FG is just the homology. You could, it's the singular homology of the sublevel set of F. Okay. So if this is my my Morse function, then uh, what I'm doing here is I cut at a height t. This is t. Then what HMT is is the homology of this. One. So clearly this depends on the function. Um, okay, so now let's let's fix the homology. Ah, oh, my hands are wet. So let's fix the homology class alpha. Let's say alpha is non-zero, and I fix a homology class alpha. And I mean a singular homology class. Okay. Now note. Uh, uh, if T is very, very small, so suppose it's less than the minimum of that, then you're looking at a height below here. So homology at that height is zero. So HMT HMT is zero. And if T is huge, so if it's bigger than the maximum of the function, then HMT is just everything. You see the singular thing. Singular homology of the minimum. Okay. So at some point between the minimum and maximum, uh, you you began to see the homology class alpha. Right. So if you so here, when T is very small, you cannot see alpha inside. It's built as the model. Cannot see alpha in here. So alpha is not in here. And so here, when P is huge, alpha is indeed, it can be. So at some point, you switch from not seeing to seeing. And that's what we call the spectral engineering of alpha. So C of alpha. So here's the formal definition. Let I sub, uh, do you want to call it I sub T be the map given by inclusion of HMT, uh, induced by inclusion of HMT into HM. We should be just thinking this is the inclusion induced by the inclusion of F less than T into the entire map. This is what the map is. And you define C of alpha comma F to be the infimum of values infimum of T such that alpha can be seen in the image of this inclusion. And that's the spectral image. So while I erase the other board, ask me the questions you have. I'll draw, what I'll do now is draw a picture in which I'll, you know, we work out the, on an example what the spectral invariance is.
So here's uh, uh, here's a nice example. Go back to the torus. Uh, so this is the torus, and here's my function f. Here's the real line. And now let's take uh, the homology class corresponding to this curve. So what we are going to do is look at look at all the sublevels of f. And, and start at, uh, at zero and come up and see at what point we actually see the homology of the homology of path alpha in, this, in the, in the sublevel set of that. So if you start here at the minimum, obviously you don't see it. There's, you, I mean, the sublevel set at this point, just the point, you cannot see out. You come a little further up, say at this height, and clearly you cannot see anything that's homologous to alpha in here. It's a contractible distance, can't contract, contain this alpha. And I think you can all see that once you hit this point, as soon as you pass this critical point, then you see curves here, which are homologous to alpha. But this is the level at which you see alpha, and that's C of alpha. Okay? That, that's the idea. Any questions? You know, I'll, I'll write down what the other spectral variants in this example are too. So this is the homology class of the point. So C of point, this is C of point F. And that's just the minimum. Uh, if you look at this curve, call it beta, well, you, you begin to see beta once you pass the second vertical point here. So, the spectral invariant corresponding to beta, C of beta f, is, is here. And finally, the, the one remaining uh, homology class is the fundamental class where you see everything, is, you see it at the max. So, so that's the, the spectral invariant for the fundamental class of the torus, and it's just a maximum. Okay, are there questions about the definition of spectral invariance? The set of T? Yeah. It's a minimum. Here, yeah, it's a minimum. Uh, well, maybe it depends on whether I put the less than or equal, but uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think it's the minimum because it's the when it's this far. So I, I start seeing, actually the way I, since I put less than, I have to go above it. So actually I have to take the, but okay. But it, it is some critical line. So uh, yeah. So maybe I'll put some properties. The properties of, these have really nice properties that I'll put on this board. Uh, other questions about the definition? So uh, the first thing is that this is C of alpha F is always a critical value of F. This is obvious from the definition. Right, uh, I mean, homology, uh, you, you see a new homology class only when you pass a critical point. You just can't see it over. Yes. No, you have no. At this point, you're seeing. Uh, so you mean after this height, you you're seeing this manifold, which is a torus with a disc removed. So you see the whole manifold, meaning the entire topology of the manifold once you reach that height. Uh, if you look at uh, the homology up to this height, there is the fundamental class list. It's got nothing in rank two. In, in index two, it's zero. Of course, you know that you kind of you know the rest of the story because the torus is You haven't seen 
if you look at the formal definition, you, have, you haven't seen it in the image of life. So, so this is uh, called, uh, this is perhaps why people call them spectral invariants, because it takes values in the spectrum of that, and the spectrum here is just the critical values. Uh, here's a second property that, that's actually important for us later. Suppose F is less than equal to G, then C of alpha F is less than equal to C of alpha G. And this is uh, this is really easy to prove. Uh, here's a proof or a hint of a proof. Well, we are, if you look at the sublevel set of F at T, since F is smaller, then this contains the sublevel set of and now G was, oh, sorry, I have to change this to an H because G was a Riemannian metric. It contains the sublevel set of H at T. So, so this set is larger, therefore you're more likely to see alpha in here first than that's it. And there's a third property that I'll put on the other board that you'll use later on as well. I think the last property of one, there, there's, a, there's a lot of properties actually, but the last one that I'll mention now is that you have the following inequality. So property three. Uh, so I want to compare the spectral invariant for F and the spectral invariant for another function H. Okay, so it turns out that you could squeeze this between maximum of F minus G and the minimum of F minus G. Ah, oh, yes. Sorry. The G oh, my God. Is this what you were pointing out, the H? Uh, I always compare, confuse Riemannian metrics with with the function. Um, okay, so the, the inequality makes sense. The, the proof you'll see is super easy, actually. The proof is is so I'll prove the right hand side, and the left hand side is the same. The proof of the right hand side is so. Note f is less than H plus maximum of F minus H. I'm just saying F minus H is less than maximum of F minus H. Then the previous inequality that said uh, these things are monotone tells you that the spectral invariant of F is less than equal to the spectral invariant of the function H plus this constant maximum of F minus H. But this is just a constant. So the effect of a constant is just that it shifts all the sublevel sets by that same constant. So shifting by constant just says you, you could bring the constant out, and this is C of alpha H plus maximum of F minus H. Okay. Now, one consequence of this third. Thing, uh, this third item is that so this C of alpha F minus C of alpha H is less than equal to the soup norm of F minus H, obviously. And so it tells you that these are Lipschitz in, in, in the function there. So if you fix alpha, then you have you have a mapping for C of alpha. If you fix alpha, this is a mapping from the space of C infinity functions on M to the real line, which is Lipschitz in the soup. Okay, uh, the infinity but Morse 
initially it was defined only for Morse, but now since it's Lipschitz, I could just extend to all C0 functions, not just C0. Does that make sense? This is just a remark, so we, we will need it later. So uh, corollary is that, uh, this was the corollary and hence, extends to a function which I denote again by C of alpha dot from now C zero functions on M to the real law. Right? The Lipschitz function always extends to its uh, to, to, to So now you could actually make sense of critical values of continuous. Start C this is this can this should be seen as the I had the list of these three properties for the CD and I said the extent to homeomorphisms. This should be uh, seen as the precursor. I mean, the proof is not the same, but uh, this gives you an idea of why this one. Okay, if I'm done with more so much, and I will you know, begin formal and switch back to the technical. So uh, if you have any questions about Morse homology or the definition of these invariants, this is a good time to ask. If not, um, uh, I'm fine for Of course, some of you might be wondering why I did more homology at all here, because you could be defining this same invariance by just looking at the singular homology at sublevel. So completely avoid the use of more homology. The reason is that that approach just has no chance of working when you do when you do floor homology. But when you think of more when you approach it via more homology in this way, you'll see uh, at a formal level it, what I'm going to do with floor homology is identical to what I do. Right, right. You, you could use various ways to do it here, but now you're on a smooth finite dimensional manifold. Now we're going to move on to uh, the loop space of the uh, manifold. And so that, that, that of course, just doesn't work. Uh, it works if you have a nice, nice function like the energy functional on the on the loop space, which is uh, what more stated in the first place. But uh, you will see for us, we're, we're going to work with the action functional, and that's how that. That's not nice enough to be able to do this sort of thing. So I'm going to first define uh, Hamiltonian, what's called floor homology has many flavors. Perhaps the simplest one to understand is what's called Hamiltonian floor homology. So for this part, I'll make some simplifying assumptions. I have a symplectic manifold M, and I assume that uh, uh, you could assume that omega, you will assume that omega vanishes on pi two. Or if you prefer, you could assume just pi two is zero. So example, you could take the force, P2 M. So meaning if you take any sphere in the manifold and you integrate the symplectic form over it, you're supposed to get so. And this is true for T2N because there, pi 2 is, so in any, this is a closed cohomology class being integrated over something that's no homologous with it. Uh, when I actually, in, in real life, yeah, you're going to actually need to remove this assumption. But okay, that, it, it's just a technical matter. And it makes the notation much simpler. So now I start with a time dependent function, which we saw yesterday, a Hamiltonian on our manifold. Uh, uh, and I assume it's non-degenerate. Again, in that same sense, uh, an assumption similar to the function being Morse. What does this mean? Well, recall H gives us, uh, you know, you have Hamilton's ODE, it gives us a flow, which I call phi PH. 
Uh, and so then you have this phi one H, which is a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. And being non-degenerate means that the fixed points of phi one H are non-degenerate. So you look at the derivative at the fixed points of matrix here, so it doesn't have one number. This is true generic. So if you just perturb the Hamiltonian, uh, the generic Hamiltonian is not. Now you could associate to this an action function. Which is denoted by A sub H. So let me first explain what the domain of this functional is. The domain is going to be what's called omega of M. It's the set of contractible loops in it. Um, so uh, I guess I want that X is contractible. So there's a map from V to M. Such that uh, the boundary of the uh, so the boundary uh, u restricted to the boundary of b gives us so it's just a it's just a set of compaction at this point let's uh we, we just assume they're smooth uh, later on we won't go into this but uh, to, to make things uh Rigorous, you'd have to assume that we pass, we need to pass an appropriate solo expectation. We, we, we won't go into that much detail. So that's that's the domain of my functional. So it takes a contractible loop and it gives us the real number. And here's the definition. So this action functional goes from omega to the real line. And uh, the definition is as follows. I take a loop X and I send it to the following quantity. So first, I integrate my Hamiltonian H. So remember that H actually depends on time. So I integrate H around the loop. And then the second term is I subtract the area of a capping disk group. So what's U for, for the loop X? So remember X is contractible. So Meaning, I have a, I, have, I can put a disk here, the choice of a contraction U, and I subtract the area of this U. Now, this is well defined. It doesn't depend on the choice of U because I assume pi 2 is 0, or because I assume omega vanishes from pi 2. So, since uh, uh, well defined, uh, well, because uh, if you have x and you have u on this side and u prime on the other side, well, the combination, the difference between the two gives you a sphere. And so uh, omega of u, uh, this integral, which I'm denoting by omega of u, is the same as omega of u prime because you have so many omega vanishing from the Okay? So this is the function for which we're going to do more tomorrow. Uh, uh, I guess I'm here, yes, but then when you read I think it says I'm changing. I think it's invariant under the response by addition of one. Just integrate and it's going to be the mean value. I mean, the first term is the mean value that will come along the loop, and the second doesn't depend on the second term. No, you can just average it. Yeah, I think I did. So when you re parameterize it, the mean value doesn't depend on the second Yes, yes. Thanks for pointing it out. Um, excuse me. Yes. Uh, uh, why this function does not depend on parameterization? Well, it's uh, the second term is just the area of that U. It's the area of a disk. 
So that doesn't depend on the choice of the reparameterization of X. And the first term is like you're yeah. taking the average of a function over a closed loop. Uh, and the average is just when you reparameterize the change of variable. I think I have this right. But the point is, uh, so I mean, you're not gonna. H depends on. So H depends on T. So then maybe it's. Uh, uh, if H doesn't depend on T, maybe it would be different. But then if H depends on T, you're, you're integrating different values, different points. So maybe, okay, so maybe it does depend on. Uh, the point, it doesn't matter if it doesn't. Does but but uh, keep in mind. I didn't define it on the space of unparametrized loops. I define it on the space of parametrized loops. Let me write what this one. At the end, you want it to be right. So if, because if you turn it, then it won't be you know, the same thing. Yeah. So it, it does depend on the separation. My bad. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, but but anyway, I haven't. I've defined it on the space of parametrized loops to begin. So, so there's nothing wrong with the uh, Okay, so now we do uh, more homology, uh, more homology for this functional. So the motto is Hamiltonian floor homology equals to be quotations Morse homology of H. Now, uh, so what do we need to do? First, we need to find the critical points of this function, uh, as before. Let us let me explain what the critical points are without actually working it out. It's a simple combination. This is the, not the old variational pr principles. Uh, a X is a critical point of AH. So it's the set of loops in M with the following property. X is the one periodic Orbit of the program. So that means uh, uh, when you start at this is x at zero and x at t. So let's say x at zero is just a point p, and x at t is phi th of t. So not, uh, and, and P is actually has to be a fixed point of the time one. Okay, so so the critical points, and, and this is an easy computation. I mean, I, I, I won't work it out because I always mess up the computation, but this is actually extremely simple. Uh, what to prove this, what you have to do is take a vector field, take the formations of this loop. So you take a vector field, Define along this loop zeta, uh, and you just uh, calculate DDS of AH at x plus s zeta. By x plus s zeta, I just mean the deformation of the loop to this uh, And uh, you will see that uh, if you do the computation, in the end, you end up with something like this. You, you do the computation, that, 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 with an excess right with the chain rule. And you get this quantity, integral of omega of xh minus x dot theta. Okay. So if you have a critical point, no matter what theta you put here, it has to be zero. So xh has to be x dot. So mean x is the flow line for the, x is the one, uh, Non periodic orbit of the flow of time.
Okay. So in particular, every fixed point, not every fixed point, but fixed points that are contractible in this sense, where you might have fixed points that don't cap a, when you look at their trajectory, they don't give you something contractible. But fixed points that are contractible are all in here. So this is in one to one correspondence with contractible fixed points. Okay. Um, Now, another notation is the spectrum of H. This is the set of critical values of H. So it's A, uh, H at X, where X is a one periodic orbit. Just notation, but the spectral invariance will take down the events. And the, are there any questions so far? So I should say, uh, Hamiltonian floor homology was introduced by floor in the first place to get lower bound for the number of fixed points or one periodic points, one periodic orbits of Hamiltonian floor. So, so, as you see, so that, I mean, that's why you're interested in the action. Critical points are exactly the object that flow over. And now, uh, the floor complex is exactly the, the same as the Morse complex. So, C F K of H is equal to the Z2 span. Of, uh, 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 of X, in, which is of critical points of this one. Okay, and now, so one periodic orbits, and now there's an index. So the index of X has to be K. The index is called the Conley Zender index, and uh, uh, I won't go into the list. You just accept for me that there is a we won't really even need it. But, it. but you should know that there isn't. And every periodic orbit does happen. If you find it. Okay, so we formed a, a vector space. Uh, now, uh... <laughs> so I could, uh, I'll recall some of these tomorrow, of course. Oh. I should probably go to this word. So there is a differential in the complex, and that's where this is where the story starts to get complicated. So there is the famous floor differential. So it's a mapping, uh, a linear map, P from CFK of H. It depends on a choice. So remember in Morse homology, we had a Riemannian metric. There's gonna be a Riemannian metric, uh, which is defined via the choice of what's called an almost complex structure. Uh, okay, and so what's J? J, let me just say right now is, uh, J is an almost complex structure on M, which means that it's a mapping uh, of the tangent bundle of M to itself, uh, such that J squared equals negative the identity. It, it maps uh, TXM to TXM. Uh, on each on each tangent space, you have like a, uh, a matrix that squares to the identity, to the negative of the identity, just like a complex. Uh, uh, you won't need to know much about complex structures, almost complex structures to define uh, to for the rest of the talk. But uh, now the differential, so then it sends x, a point x, 
I'll just put the definition tomorrow uh, on the board right now. And then tomorrow we'll talk about a little bit about where the definition comes from. Okay. So you send X to a sum. Again, there is gonna be a count of certain objects. These are going to be the negative gradient trajectories of the action functional. And then Y over all points Y such that the index of Y or the colonies and their index of Y is equal to the index of X minus one. So what's an object in here? This M hat, as before, is going to be, there's going to be the space of gradient trajectories from X to Y. And we're going to quotient out by R. And what are the objects in here? It's gradient flow lines in M uh, uh, of the action functional. And they are all satisfy the following equation. There, so keep in mind, U, uh, U has to be a gradient trajectory. So U is a map from the real line into the loop space of that. So U of S is a loop. So I could bring this over and think of U as a map from the cylinder into M. So I put S here and T here. And U is a gradient trajectory of the action functional if it satisfies the following equation. Ds at U plus J at U times DT of U minus XH has to be zero. Uh, I'll say a little bit about where this comes from tomorrow, but this is Floor's equation. And what we're gonna do, uh, you, you know, what we're gonna do is put a Riemannian metric on the loop space, count the gradient trajectories with respect to that Riemannian metric. And then it turns out that something that's supposed to be a gradient trajectory has to satisfy a PDE like this. But this is a very well-defined elliptic PDE. So there's a nice theory behind uh, the, in analysis that can be applied to count the solutions of this object and, and prove almost all the theorems I stated for more small than the gradient trajectory, the more small you actually fold in this setting uh, if you get a well-defined differential that's square to the rule. I'll go over all this tomorrow. But this is, so this is, these are the sort of objects that have to be. Now, as a sanity check, imagine uh, H doesn't depend on P, so that the integral, uh, sorry, doesn't depend on the parametrization. If H doesn't depend on T, uh, uh, then this term vanishes. And what you get is that ds of u plus j of u, uh, you get ds of u equals uh, j xh. Now, almost complex structure has the property that j times xh is actually gradient of h. So in those cases, you see that the honest Morse gradient trajectories of h, a time independent function are actually floor trajectory. So, so there's a good sanity check. Here. Now, uh, please don't get caught up too much in this, the details of the construction here. But in the end of the day, all we need to know from this is that uh, the differential is well defined and square to zero. You're not going to need to actually know why it's, although I'll say you will. Uh, 